Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy and much more in the way of innovation. What energy and what innovation looks like for 2023? Um, what innovations can we expect? With Richard Ha, our old friend in Hilo, and Brittany Zimmerman, our new friend in Hilo. Okay, Richard Ha and uh, Brittany Zimmerman, thank you for very much for joining us today. Richard, I, I want to ask you if you wouldn't mind introducing Brittany. Would you do that for me? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Brittany Zimmerman is um, CEO and founder of um, uh, com, and she's a high-level uh, person that worked in the space industry. And when she looked back at the, the earth, she was she just couldn't uh, stay there anymore. She she came back and 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 started to figure out how can we make um, life better here on Earth. So so essentially, and she can explain all this. But essentially, what she does is a, a net negative life cycle analysis approach to um, the way she does, you know, uh, dealing with carbon. So I'll, I'll say that much, and, and Brittany can explain the rest. Yeah, we're going to need to have your explanation, Brittany. <laughs> we have to go further to, to understand what you've been doing. Tell us. Awesome. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for having me with you today, Jay. Um, love being here, and uh, Richard for bringing me with. Um, yeah, my background, like Richard mentioned, is in the space industry. So. Uh, I'm an innovator in that space, uh, training uh, originally through mechanical and aerospace engineering, uh, graduate work focused on bioregenerative physiochemical hybrid life support systems for long duration space flight. So now we, I in really- my, in, my, in my house, we talk about little else at dinner time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Yeah. So um, really what I do um, is I bridge the gap between uh, the NASA scientists approach, which is nature based solutions, um, R&D, and more of the NASA engineers approach, which is rotating machinery, chemical reactions, filtration systems, things along those lines. But it's uh, my responsibility to keep humans alive uh, in outer space conditions. So a lot of space suit space station, spacecraft, and habitat design. So did that for a long period of time. Uh, very early in my career was selected as the youngest NASA principal investigator um, and really leveraged that, uh, brought in large amounts of funding and led teams through the development of different technologies from TRL, which is a technology readiness level one, which is just an idea or concept, and then maturing that all the way through the development cycle until something is integrated and commercialized. So did that for a great deal of time, got uh, technologies on the International Space Station, um, the Artemis programs, developed some habitats that are slated for our visits to the Martian surface, and a whole slew of stuff for the Department of Defense. And uh, like, like Richard mentioned, um, had a pretty big existential shift and wanted to start bridging the gap between the technologies that we developed for outer space solutions and make sure that we bring those solutions here to Earth for terrestrial commercialization, right? For um, human betterment applications here on our own planet. So that's um, kind of the genesis story. Wow! So. Wow! So when you when you were up there in space, as as Richard said, and, and you decided to come back down, <laughs> came back down to Hilo. And why Hilo and what is what are you doing in Hilo now that makes it special for Hilo? Some people say that Hilo is the center of science in the state, but I'll let, you, I'll let you discuss that. It must be the water, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's good water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, when I had my big existential shift, um, I decided in fact to step away from the space industry for a little while. It was a pretty big ordeal. I had a lot going on as being groomed as the CEO of a private space organization. And so um, with that, I brought a lot of really impressive individuals who decided to stay, take a step forward and wanted to come with on this new initiative um, to focus on some of the existential issues that we're facing as humanity here. And uh, yeah, that was extremely exciting for us. 
Uh, we've come together. We've grown a lot. We're over 300 graduate level experts from more than 50 different countries as a group now. And um, yeah, we target um, rebalancing carbons uh, as our first existential issue. Um, and we do that in some pretty innovative ways. So uh, we extract greenhouse gases directly from the environment. So we pull out CO2, CH4s, NOx, SOx, other particulates. Uh, we do that atmospherically and oceanically at the same time. And then um, we also bring in waste feedstocks. So we bring in uh, municipal solid waste. We can bring in agricultural waste. We can bring in cesspool waste, metals, plastics, glasses, agricultural waste, um, construction waste, uh, industrial waste. Anything that has carbon in its molecular chain is fair game for us. That's really what we're working on balancing. So we have waste as our only input to the system. And then we do some nerdy stuff in the middle, which is mostly electrochemistry and organic chemistry. But we break those carbon chains down. Um, and then we utilize all of those building blocks that we pulled apart to build those back into sustainable commodities. And so, Jay, are you familiar with the term biomimicry? Yes, I am. How do you like that? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> so that's what we do. So it's a biomimicry technology. We looked at Mother Nature and we said, Mother Nature takes waste and breaks it down and produces minerals, soils, atmosphere, and water out of it. Is there any way that we could replicate that so that we don't have a waste stream that we're producing of our own? And so that's what we do. We produce four commodities in our system. Uh, we produce a mineral, which is a net negative alternative to concrete. Pretty cool stuff. Let me see. I usually have some here. All right. So uh, we make some of this. Uh, this is entirely made from on-island waste. Uh, nothing mined, nothing imported. Um, really beautiful stuff, no release of any greenhouse gases in its production, and its mechanical properties are the most, they're far super, superior to traditional uh, concretes. Um, and you we, can build houses with it. Houses, roads, tarmacs, sidewalks, precast, block, anything you traditionally make with concretes and cement products right now. So it's really, really good stuff. Um, we've been uh, working with uh, some of the DOTs um, and some of the leading industry, uh, ACI and other folks in evaluating a lot of these uh, materials. And it's really exciting. Uh, we went through trial mixing and it's actually the strongest material that they had uh, tested at that particular DOT in terms of pavements. So it's really, really beautiful stuff. Cool. And, Richard, um, Richard, how do you keep, keep up with Brittany? I'm um, I'm having a little trouble doing that today, but <laughs> how, how about you? How about you, Richard? Well, you know, I I just see the big picture. You know, I I don't understand all this stuff, but you know, when she talks about life cycle analysis, and you, uh, it, it's really common sense for for the average for me anyway. So, but yeah, hard to keep up with the technical stuff. I can't do that. <laughs> I got him to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps up better than he likes to let on <laughs> i know i know that's the story of richard that's why he's so lovable so so uh Brittany, you know uh what's the common denominator the secret sauce that that flows through all of this science and technology you're talking about is it the biomimicry or something else what is it that um that enables you to do this 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 and this Right. So yeah, this, 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 and this, right? We make the concrete, we make a biochar product, we make green hydrogen, and we also make potable drinking water. Those are the four byproducts of our system. And really, I would say this secret sauce is a systems to system of systems of approach, right? My background being in the space industry, uh, when you're on a spacecraft or you're in long duration space flight, every single molecule is so precious, right? You can't jettison that or lose it from your system because you don't have the ability to rendezvous or get a lot of those materials back. So you have to put in the resources and the time and the energy and the innovation to figure out how to really respect those and recycle those things. And so we've applied that same methodology here um, and really modeled it as a closed loop system. And uh, we think every single molecule in the entire system uh, and our system is the whole planet Earth, right, is extremely precious. And so, we take care of all of it. We don't optimize off of one specific parameter. We look at all of them simultaneously. So it's a, that's it's a, it's a way of thinking. 
It's a it way is. of seeing the, the world. It's a way of seeing the universe, which yes. is interesting. And, and once you adopt that way of thinking, you know, you're really expanding the universe or at least expanding your way of looking at it. And you're expanding how you apply the science to it. But let's, let's go to you and the Big Island and Hawaii in general. Where, where's the intersection between, you know, the, the things you've been doing in the space industry and the things you have identified here um, that, that need the technology? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we piloted our facility, um, we did that on the con continental mainland. Uh, and honestly, Hawaii wasn't really in the vision uh, at that point in time. Um, and when we realized how effective uh, what we had developed was, as you can imagine, being from 50 different countries, I was pulled in a lot of different directions. Everybody had a really good reason why we should develop uh, the full scale system in their particular country. And so in order to remain a contigu contiguous and um, uh, you know, pulled together team with a common vision, uh, it was really important for us um, to come together and decide that we would allow it to be a data-driven decision instead. And um, we built up a tool and that tool evaluated a whole bunch of things that we thought were really important, right? We looked at, um, the socioeconomic impact of developing different technologies. This is a we software looked, tool? Yeah, we built it up. Uh, it's a GIS it's a so, it's package. It's a software tool. Uh, it's software uh, built with GIS, yeah, and a decision down select matrix pulled together. That's correct. It's not like and a so, wrench or anything. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a software package. Okay, okay. <laughs> Custom designed, that's right. Got it, got it. And, <laughs> It was a magic eight ball, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, it was it was really important for us because you know we looked at um, the cost of energy in places worldwide, right? We looked at places that were dealing with a lot of water poisoning issues or access to clean water. We looked at places that had a uh, very fertile soils historically that had been depleted, right? Things along these lines, and so we built it up. We built all the mathematics into the tool and we said, you know, we're pretty sure everybody's pretty sure their country was going to land at the top of the list somewhere. So we shook hands and we ran the analysis and um, the results came out and we thought the tool was broken because the top 70 some locations were all islands. And so we tested the tool. We tried to figure out where the break was. Turns out the break was actually in our minds. It wasn't in the tool. Um, and just how we perceived the world around us. So it uh, ended up being correct. And uh, that was a really big eye opener for us. And so we started focusing specifically on how we could bring the solutions to islands, which meant we had to change what we had been working on a little bit um, to be more compatible with island implementation. And so we worked on that. And uh, I had two folks on the team who had been with us the, the entire time and they grew up in Hawaii. And they made a really strong case, Jay. They said, you don't need a visa to travel there. So you're not limited by time. You understand the language. You understand the banking system, right? You understand the law and the corruption that does or does not exist. And um, all of those things will be issues in a lot of the other places that we decide to build. But at least they won't happen, you know, at the same time as we're working and building our full, our full scale implementation. For well, let me time. ask you so, two questions about what you said. Number one is you talk about a team and it, yes. it's, it's uh, dawning on me that the team is not necessarily in Hilo. The team That's is correct. everywhere. You, you, you're you covering are. a lot of countries. There's almost 200 countries in the world. How many of them uh, have your team members in them? Uh, between 50 and 60. Wow. Yeah. And these are, these are scientists? All kinds of things. Uh, scientists, uh, but also non-technical uh, as well. We have a lot of people in policy, in education, uh, in equity, in culture studies, in business, in strategy, in finance, oh. all that stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're talking about ambitious projects here. No kidding. <laughs> well, the other thing you mentioned was uh, something about islands. Uh, uh, you know, and, and we know that Hawaii is a special place because it is an island and it's a great laboratory, you know, emphasis on the word laboratory, um, because you have a sort of controlled environment here and you can study things here, you know, within that controlled environment and learn faster and better and more and so forth. I'm 
We haven't mm-hmm. talked about it in a while, but this is this has a lot to do with the science at UH, treating mm-hmm. Hawaii as a laboratory. Um, is that what you found, that islands yield special venues for science for this kind of technology? Um, I think it's easier for people to conceptualize a, a closed loop system on things that are physically isolated in the way that an island is isolated. So I think that helps, right? When we look at designing spacecraft, for example, it's very easy to isolate the system because you have the vacuum of space around you. Um, on Earth, right, really the Kármán line and the, the differentiation between Earth and space is really our boundary. But that's bigger than a lot of us are, you know, are thinking often. So I think the island provides a really nice, you know, analogy for that that makes it easier um, for us to kind of think about closing the loop and really look at what the inputs and outputs are and what our boundary conditions are. So I think it provides exactly that, Jay, a really nice, maybe, you know, maybe it's a laboratory, but maybe more of a demonstration than anything else. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you for that. So, and you talk to them, you talk to them all the time. How do you talk to them? And do you have large groups, small groups, combination? Uh, you've got to strap your brains together in a project, in, a, in yes. an approach like the one you've been describing. Uh, how do you strap the brains together? Yeah, so we work mostly virtually, right? Because we're in over 50 different countries. So we come together. Uh, we have things we call subsystem teams or concept breakout groups. And um, those are all of all different sizes. Uh, really depends on the things that people are ambitious about and passionate about, and uh, how many people it takes to tackle a lot of the things that each of those subsystems are doing. So um, we we mostly uh, communicate. Uh, we have um, different platforms, software packages that we communicate through, but we also utilize, of course, a lot of Zoom, telephone, and email as well. And if it's real time, it means uh, you have to. You have to cope with time zones, right? Yes. How do you do that? Um, we A lot of our meetings are duplicated. So we have uh, a meeting that is great for the Eastern Hemisphere and one that's really great for the Western Hemisphere. So. And it's all, in Eng- <laughs> it's all in English, am I right? It is primarily in English. We do have a French club, though. We have a philosophy club also, but a lot of French speakers. <laughs> <laughs> philosophy club. Now, that goes back to my last question, based on what you were saying a minute ago. You described the the problem um, that you you had some kind of barrier and you realized that it was a thought process barrier, that Mm -hmm. you were missing something and you had to figure that out. And then you got you got past that. Um, Can you give us a little detail on what the barrier was, why it was stopping you? And how you managed to get past it? Um, I think in org- as an organization or as an individual, anybody who's trying to solve issues, um, it's the responsibility of the captain of that specific ship to foresee a lot of obstacles and make sure that those obstacles are removed or at least small enough um, to surmount Right once the team gets there. So we have a pretty interesting way of uh, tackling different problems on the team. So uh, one of the ways that we particularly do that is, right, we look at what issues uh, we're facing, whether that be financial, whether that be technical, whether that be social. um, And we start having conversations with people who are the best in the world about it. So uh, we reach out and we contact those individuals. And we usually have a few of them who end up joining the team and spearheading those efforts for us. So instead of trying to gain the new skill, right, in terms of trying to tackle something we haven't tackled before, our philosophy is really bringing people in who have the expertise, who have who have tackled similar issues in the past. Why do so, I feel um, that the term do. multidisciplinary applies here? This is yes. really, <laughs> really talking about all the disciplines, aren't you? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. I mean, I, you know, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, and uh, I am I am wondering how you apply that to Hawaii. But before we do that, I, I want to ask Richard a question. Richard, um, how is Brittany doing? It's it's, it's uh, I think she's doing really well. Yeah. So and you know, with our focus being on how can we make life better for Kyoki and Malia. To today, 25 years in the future, and what she's doing is it in parallel to that uh, to our efforts, so it makes life better for them. 
So, so I think she's doing great. Hey, how, how am I doing in forming questions for her? Hey, you're pretty good, man. <laughs> <laughs> just, just checking up with you, Richard. <laughs> so, Brittany, you know, let's talk more about the intersection. You know, what I get from this discussion is there a vi- you know, you could solve any problem. As I don't know if you've had contact with uh, Stanford and design thinking, you know, the way it's your thought process and takes you into solving the problem. But the first mm-hmm. thing you have to do is identify, accurately identify the problem. Yep. <laughs> you want to solve a problem that's really a problem, you know? Um, yep. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, from the discussion so far, it, we're talking about we're talking about energy, renewable energy. We're talking about carbon, of course. We, we're talking about climate change. We're talking about yep. global affairs uh, and um, you know global collaborations, global science, if you will. Um, and I suppose I suppose we haven't even scratched the surface here by identifying those things because if we sit sort of like the Stanford design thinking. And we try to identify the problems. There are so many problems in the world today. And my personal view is that we can solve them all, or at least we can make advances yeah. on them. And the, yeah. the, you know, the secret is, uh, what do I call it? Sincere technology, you yeah. know, altruistic technology, <laughs> yeah. which I, I think I hear you talking about. So talk about the problems you know, like, that you could identify in Hawaii, like energy. Like how the, yep. the thought process and the technology could help the state of Hawaii in terms of its um, its its aspirations to get to clean energy by twenty forty. Yeah, that's a great question, Jay. So um, we're very circular, right, in terms of what we're trying to do. And so when we started tackling how to balance carbon, we realized you can't actually turn the knob. Uh, that adjusts carbon without affecting water cycles, without affecting agriculture, without affecting energy, right? All of these things are very intertwined. So that's why you see solutions that are really system level approaches touching all of those arenas because we're taking all of them into account. So right, as as the first problem we were trying to focus was identified uh, as balancing carbons, right? We have excess carbons um, in our atmosphere but we need those carbons uh, in our soils, right? They're fantastic for us in our soils. We're a carbon-based life form. So it's not a war against carbon. It's just, hey, we've put some of them in the wrong places. Let's see what we can do to put them back where they need to go. Um, In doing that, right, we ended up uh, developing solutions that help with um, uh, affordable housing, um, that help with sustainable building materials, things along those lines, right? As a sequestration methodology, Uh, for the carbons. Uh, We ended up uh, producing our biochar material, right? Our biochar material is is about 88% carbon, um, and that really helps sequester uh, uh, carbons in the soils, which is where they're needed, but additionally helps with food security, reducing uh, our reliance on synthetic fertilizers, heavy chemicals, things along those lines, uh, reduce, you know, making uh, crops more drought resistant, things along, you know, things in that arena. So that's more of in the food sector. So we really target a lot of that. Um, And then additionally, uh, we do water, right? That's a byproduct. So that starts tackling a lot of the problems that Hawaii is facing um, in terms of uh, replenishing and recleaning a lot of the waters that have been damaged due to many different uh, human activities. Um, And also working through uh, water treatment, desalination, things along those lines. So the sea levels rise and as our production of gray and black waters increase. Um, we also then finally touch, uh, well, not finally, I guess there's two more. We also touch more of the green energy side of things uh, as we produce very, very large amounts um, of green hydrogen. Uh, this is very important, right? Because we do it very scalably uh, and we compete with 30 hydrogen prices in the production of the green hydrogen. So that helps a lot. Um, and our process is also autothermic. So we're an off-grid solution, right? And uh, in the breaking of these bonds, we produce a lot of uh, heat, right? Exothermic heat, and we do cogenerations. We're actually translating that excess heat into electrical energy, which powers our entire system. So it's renewable in a different type of a way. Um, And then uh, finally, also waste management, right? Waste management is a really big problem on all of the islands that I've visited. 
Um, so having a place that can, all of that waste can be diverted um, so that it's not, you know, being buried, leaching, having to be shipped off islands, all of these things that we're currently doing, you know, as quote unquote solutions, you know, unfortunately we're doing a lot of incineration also, which releases uh, additional toxins into the environment. This provides a methodology and a mechanism to help alleviate the concerns in all of those places and all of those arenas simultaneously. Richard, did I mention about the uh, the uh, the pop quiz at the end at the end of this program? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might you might be wondering what my function is here. Yeah. Yes. And what it is is I I, I am advocate for the rubber slipper folks. So so I want to make sure that the folks you know uh, are are being considered. And and Brittany can 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 give you an idea. You know, like for example. She spent a lot of time in many different places on this island. If she explains that to you, you get a better sense of, of her attempt to make sure it's a bottom-up approach as well as a top-down approach. Yeah. Well, what I get is it's a it's a taking a look at the entire environment, taking a look at the elements of our lives together on the planet, and and rebalancing them. You know, it, it's sort of like you see the the floods in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and then you see the droughts around the Colorado River. So in one case, it's too much water. In the other case, it's too little water. And and as the science would have it, you try to rebalance that so you have the right amount of water in the right place. Uh, and then you can do better agriculture and your, and your cities and towns aren't destroyed. Um, and that may be adaptation, which isn't necessarily a solution to climate change, but at least it makes life easier for humanity. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I think I hear you saying rebalancing, identifying all these elements that may be too much or too little, or that can, you know, connect and collaborate with each other and make life better without any, any risk. Um, and so um, in Hawaii, anyway, we do have energy issues. Um, we, we do have, uh, you know, aspirations of clean energy. Um, we do have energy that's too expensive. Even on the Big Island, uh, we need to make it. I'm just presenting problems to you, a la Stanford design thinking. Is, are these all within your wheelhouse, Brittany? Uh, can you provide science that would address all of these things? And agriculture, don't forget agriculture. <laughs> we need to grow food here. Richard yeah. knows he's, he's a farmer in his heart and soul. He'll never stop. Um, but, but query, um, does your science address these things? and connect these things and give us solutions on these things. Yes, Jay. And so very simply, right, we process waste and we take that waste just like Mother Nature does and we break it down to do very simple things, right? We clean the air. It cleans the water. It gives us a place to recycle the waste, right, without a waste stream being generated. It helps provide energy and it helps make extremely healthy soils. So those are the things that we do, right? That's that's the the simple version um, of the science, all kind of tied up with it. <laughs> so where are you on the continuum? I imagine you you have a a, a website. Uh, you met, is it? Did I pronounce that right? You may. You may. Oh, it's French. How oh, good. I yes. like French. You may. You may. dot com. Yes. Okay. Well, that's correct. And so um, I could look. I could look at that website and I could see some of the discussion around these ideas, but um, how far down the track are you? How close are you to, you know, making working models that actually, you know, effectuate these ideas on the planet? And, mm -hmm. and how far are you from commercialization where you can make them economically sustainable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've already piloted the facility. We're past proof of concept. We ran our MVPs. We third party verified everything. Uh, we're already producing material, uh, all of the materials. Um, so we make, right, I don't know if you've seen biochar. This is biochar, we call it black gold. Um, so we produce all of the stuff already. Uh, we do it at smaller scales. So what we're working on right now is more of the commercialization scale uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, we've been working with the local communities uh, the state um, and with the county um, here on Big Island uh, to 
find specific locations, uh, make sure any uh, issues are addressed, uh, that the community's involved, start having conversations around that. So um, that's where we're at. We're right now finalizing a location and looking at what permits need to be held and doing what we can um, in those arenas to address the problems for all the different communities. Because like uh, Richard said, I've visited a lot of them. I've lived in almost all of the cities, making circles around uh, the big island here. So uh, just trying to make a solution for everybody. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Now I want to ask you a question where, where you have to whisper the answer. Okay, I'm ready. You have patents? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> tell, tell me international patents. Yes. International PCT. patents, and are they are they provisional or are they final patents? They're PCTs. Provisional patents, all within what two years old and all that. Uh, yeah. So it's past provisional. It's not provisional anymore. Um, so after you go through provisional, then you go to the next stage, right? And so uh, the next stage for us is in the international realm. So the PCT uh, is that international protection. So we essentially have 18 months and we have to decide which of the countries, you know, we want to be doing business in and operating in and protected. In. So that's what we're doing. Well, do you like, you like all your patents? Because sometimes people take patents out that they find out, eh, it may, it may not be. <laughs> do you and like love all them. your patents? Do you love your yes. patents? Okay. Love so, them. Have you hugged your patent today? Uh, yeah, I uh, have a little shrine, uh, <laughs> give my offerings each day. <laughs> so what about what about affiliations and connections and, and for that matter, media? Um, because, um, you know, I mean, it's not essential for what you're doing because you already have a, a global network, but it's probably helpful if you want to, you know, advance some of these ideas and, and projects here in Hawaii and to have a network in Hawaii. And that means what the university it means media connections appearances like think tech wow so that, that, <laughs> <laughs> are you laughing richard stop that <laughs> so, so uh, how far down the path are you with that because we want to know more about you and we want the state to know more about you well thank you uh yeah we um don't do too much on social media um uh, for us, we really love organic relationships. So that's why I'm boots on the ground. Uh, I spend most of my day out in the community, uh, meeting new individuals, um, business owners, community leaders, um, visiting you know as many different places, like I said, on the island as possible to get a good feel for what the issues being faced are. Um, in terms of affiliation, uh, right, we have relationships with, are doing work with, or at least in communication with a lot of different groups um, here, um, all the way from uh, the universities. So we do some work with the UH Hilo, the extension programs, UH Manoa, um, just uh, started relationships up and spoke with at the community college here also. Um, And then uh, additionally, um, working with the NRCS offices, the USDA offices, more on the agricultural side of things, working with the Hawaii DOT, um, as well as some other state DOTs. Um, We are working with um, some of the local nonprofits, building relationships there, some of the conservationist groups, uh, local construction groups. Um, I could go for a really long time. Yes, affiliations and partnerships are important. (laughs) (laughs) I I have about 500 people I'd like you to I like you to meet. I'd like Wonderful. To, I, I would like to, like to meet all of them. <laughs> Are you publishing, Brittany? Pardon? Are you publishing? Uh, publishing what? Books, uh, articles, white papers? <laughs> the all answer the is yeah, yes, the probably thing. on all of them. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, you have anything that I could get? Is it on your website? Uh, should I go on Amazon? Where do I read your stuff? Um, I can send it to you personally, Jay. So um, I would uh, encourage anybody to reach out directly to the team. Uh, there is a contact form uh, on the website, but I am the most communicative uh, both through email and through LinkedIn. So if anybody utilizes LinkedIn um, and my email address is my first name, Brittany at yame, Y-U-M-M-E-T dot com. So yame, easy I to find. It. I love it. And so Richard, uh, I asked you earlier to introduce Brittany. Um, for the show. Now I'm going to ask you to make a, a summary, a summarization 
of all that we have learned with her and from her today. Go. Yeah, well, what impresses me about what Brittany does is, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, looking at it from the point of view of a farmer, yeah, and uh, and also the rubber slipper uh, representing rubber slipper folks, and and she does that in a really really good way. So it's easy for people to understand what it is she wants is is trying to do, because this can get people lost, yeah, this whole thing. But but she does a really good job of uh, uh, explaining it, and and that's why I'm so committed to to uh, supporting her because, like I said, you know our mission is to make life better for Kyoki and Malia, uh, one generation from now, and that's what she's doing. Yeah, you're a treasure for us. You got you know got to keep going. One thing that strikes me though is that it, it, assume for a moment with me that in some ways. Hawaii is a laboratory, um, and what you're learning and doing here, um, you know, would be useful, say, on the mainland, you know, where they have droughts and floods and the like, and mm -hmm. agricultural problems and what have you. Um, and, you know, I, Richard doesn't know this, but they also have rubber slipper people on the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and oh, I have you thought about you know taking the benefit of your labor, the fruits of your labor, to the mainland and trying to you know help people there in the same way. Once you've established um, you know the the systems you're talking about here in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, and not just the mainland, but the entire world, Jay. Um, so really focusing on Hawaii being the first place. Um, so that they can be the leaders in sustainability, right? Uh, we're working on a scale right now that would actually remove more greenhouse gases from the environment than the entire island actually emits. So being seen as the first modern civilization that can operate in a net negative fashion uh, in very short order uh, could be a very big light, uh, not only for islands in the United States, um, but for groups worldwide. So we're really looking at bringing that to as many places we can uh, thereafter, because with between 40 and 50 locations worldwide, we could actually be removing all of the anthropogenically released carbon dioxide or all of the CO2 that humans uh, emit. So that's what we're shooting for. Well, OK. I mean, it, you know, it sounds like saving the world or at least going in that direction <laughs> anyway. And I, and I hope we can get there, at least in substantial part in the near term because yeah. we are very threatened existentially by climate change. Yes. But once you do that, once you save the world, Brittany, okay, yeah. and it's clear more than most people I know you are going to do that, um, yeah. are you going to go back to space? I think uh, as a team, we've decided we will tackle whatever the next most pressing existential issue is. So we'll see what that happens to be. If it's space related, then yes. And if not, then I'm staying here. <laughs> okay, well, first first the world and, and then the galaxy. Uh, <laughs> Brittany Zimmerman and Richard Hoth, thank you so much, you guys, for coming on the show. Really appreciate so the discussion. And speaking for Richard, he really appreciated the discussion too. Right, Richard? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Okay, Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook. Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.